have been like at the time. Um, last weekend was actually Easter Sunday in the Orthodox Church, so it's not that unusual that as we work through the story, we've actually come to back to the resurrection again this week. Um, as Kim and I have both mentioned over these last few weeks, we don't expect you to agree with everything that we say during our messages. We've got a very wide range of theology in the United Church of Canada. We have people who believe differently from each other, and yet um, we are able to come together and to worship together. And as Christians, we all need to be challenged to really examine why we believe things and not just say that we believe them because the Bible tells us so. We really have to stop and th think through why we believe what we do. Um, as I said before, my theology has certainly changed over the years. I like to focus more now on, a, on original blessing rather than original sin. And like Kim mentioned last week, I also don't believe that the um, Jesus dying on the cross was plan B for God, that it was something that um, uh, a mistake that happened that God had to rectify and, and um, bring something down to stop us from all being damned to hell. I believe that it really was a sign of Jesus showing us God's unconditional love on the cross. But central to my faith remains the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A Sunday school teacher once asked her, her children um, on a Sunday before Easter if they knew what happened on Easter Sunday and why it was important to them. One little girl spoke up saying, Easter is when the whole family gets together and uh, you eat turkey and you sing and you talk about the pilgrims arriving and the Indians and stuff like that. Well, no, said the teacher, that's not Easter. The next child says, I know what Easter is. Said, Easter is when you get a wonderful tree and you decorate it and you give gifts to everyone and you sing lots of great songs. Well, nope, that's not either, said the teacher. Finally, a third student spoke up and she said, Easter is when Jesus was killed and put in a tomb and left for three days. Oh, inside the teacher was so happy. And then the child continued. And then after three days, Jesus came out, and he didn't see a shadow, so he went back in for six more weeks. <laughs> there are some really funny ideas about uh, the resurrection out there, both from children and from adults as well. While I believe in the, the resurrection of, of Jesus, as I say, it's not just enough for me to, to say that I do. I need to be able to explain, if someone asks me why I believe that, why I do. You know, what has led me to believe that over the years. Um, I'd love to be able to say that I just believe in the resurrection because of the Bible, but for me it's not that easy. I'm a little too scientific for that, just to go by faith. Um, I'm not that holy. There's a really good bit of doubting Thomas inside me that I like to be able to, you know, try and figure out um, both faith-wise and intellectually why I believe in something. And two of the people that have greatly influenced uh, my belief in the resurrection are Malcolm Muggeridge and Josh McDowell. Malcolm Muggeridge, who passed away in 1990, was an avowed agnostic British journalist he was a satirist, an author, a media personality, a former World War II spy. He set out to prove as a journalist, beyond a doubt, that the resurrection was a hoax and never happened. Josh McDowell was another, um, was another avowed agnostic who also set out to do the same thing, but he decided to write a full university thesis on this to try and disprove that the resurrection ever happened. What happened to both of them was not expected. Their scientific and journalistic investigations led them both firmly to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Their goal was to bury this resurrection nonsense once and for all. But in the end, they both came to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus was a fact. Now, early dating of our Gospels by archaeological experts find that they were written in a, a period of history when eyewitnesses to the account still would have been available to the writers. Sir William Ramsey, who was a Scottish archaeologist who spent 15 years trying to undermine the credentials of the gospel writers, and especially Luke, he tried to prove that he was not a good historian. 
He concluded that Luke is a historian of the first rank. This author should be placed among the very greatest of historians through history. So let's look at some of the facts that we, that we know about the resurrection. The first fact that we know is that the Romans placed a seal on the tomb. And the consequences of breaking this seal on the tomb were very severe. If you were caught doing that in any way, or, or just doing anything to the seal, it meant automatic execution by being crucified upside down. The second fact that we're told is that the tomb was empty. The disciples preached the empty tomb in Jerusalem, the very place where it would have been very easy for people to have been able to show that what they were saying was lying if it wasn't true. The German theologian Paul Althaus stated, the resurrection could not have been maintained in Jerusalem for a single day, for a single hour, if the emptiness of the tomb had not been established beyond a fact for all concerned. And the interesting thing is both Jewish and Roman historians and sources admit that the tomb was empty. Dr. Paul Meyer, who's professor of emeritus of ancient history, stated that if a source admits a fact decidedly not in its favor, then that fact is almost always genuine. The third fact we know was that the stone was moved. And this, we're talking about a 1.5 ton stone approximately that would have been used at the time. And it wasn't just moved, it was blown away up an incline and away from the massive sepulcher. Fact number four, the Roman guard ran away. Now, Roman guards didn't normally run away. The penalties were incredibly um, nasty. For falling asleep on duty or for abandoning their post, one of the things that would happen is they'd be stripped of their clothes, the clothes would be made into a fire, and then they would be burnt on the fire. So the fear of punishment produced flawless attentiveness to duty, especially during the night watches. Fact number five, the, the grave clothes told a tale. In a literal sense, the, the tomb wasn't empty because there were the grave clothes uh, in the form of a body sli slightly caved in as if the body just left them like an insect leaving its chrysalis. Fact number six, Jesus' appearances after his death were confirmed. Paul the Apostle appealed to the knowledge of 500 people that saw Jesus at the same time. The Japanese historian um, Dr. Yamauchi said, what gives a special authority to the list of historical evidence is the reference to most of the 500 people still being alive. So people could have just gone to any of the 500 and questioned them at the time. Fact number seven was a big one. There were hostile witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Jesus appeared to those who were hostile to him. Perhaps the most famous one was Saul. Saul, a Pharisee of Pharisees who spent his time hunting down Christians. In fact, he was on his way to Damascus to kill more Christians, to hunt them down and to kill them. The resurrected Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and one of the greatest transformations in the history of a man happened on that road with Paul becoming willing to eventually die for Christ and for the belief in the resurrection. So he went from murdering Christians to allowing himself to be killed because of his faith in Christ. And of course, the, the apostles needed convincing, especially Thomas, to just believe in this. They were afraid, they were cowering in a room, needing strength. Those are the facts that have been put forward over the years. There's also been some theories put forward. One of the theories was that the authorities went to the wrong tomb and were looking in the wrong tomb for Jesus. But Roman, the Roman and the Jewish authorities would definitely have found the, ro the right tomb very quickly, produced the body, and put this whole idea of the resurrection to pass there for one, you know, in one go. If Jesus' body had been produced, then we wouldn't be talking about this today. Some people thought maybe they... They were hallucinating when they saw Jesus, but the amount of people that saw him and the evidence of the different appearances don't se seem to fit with the psychological principles governing the appearance of hallucinations. Some people thought Jesus just fainted and was put in the tomb and then came out again. Um, skeptic theologian David Strauss, who 
certainly no believer in the resurrection, did say that uh, it's impossible that a being who had stole half dead out of the sepulcher, who crept about weak and ill, wanting medical treatment, who required bandaging, strengthening, indulgence, and who still at last yielded to his sufferings, could have given to the apostles the impression that he was conqueror over death and the grave. The Romans were also extremely efficient in making sure that everybody was dead before they came off the cross. And with Jesus, of course, we're told that they made the extra effort of sticking the spear in his side just to make sure. The final uh, theory was perhaps the body was stolen. Well, the, certainly the, the depression and the cowardice of the apostles at the time and the fact that there was a 1.5 ton stone in Roman guard doesn't make it very likely that the apostles would have made a uh, daring rescue of the body. There's no reason for the Romans to steal the body. That would have been very counterproductive. Obviously, they wanted to show the body so that this would be put to sleep. So these are some of, some of the facts, some of the theories that have gone ar around. And one of the things that always amazes me is why will we go to a store and buy a history book of something that happened a few hundred years ago, written recently, and just automatically believe what's in the history book, and yet we don't seem to put the same so type of investigation into religious-based books at all. When I was growing up as a child in England, I used to read uh, a lot of books about the British Empire and battles and things like that, and I thought that it was all true. Everything that I read I thought was the British going to civilize people in other countries. Why? Because they were written by the British, they were written by the victors. History books are normally written by the victors, and so quite often are not as accurate as we often think they are. Professor Thomas Arnold, um, he was the headmaster of rugby school and the author of The History of Rome, chair of uh, modern history at Oxford University. And he says these words, I, he says, I have been used, used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in history of, ma of the mankind which has proved better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God gave us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. For me, the, the, personally, the most compelling evidence is the fact that people were willing to die for their beliefs. We know that almost that all of the apostles died, were put to death because of their beliefs. We know that there were hundreds of years of history of people being put to death because of their beliefs, as there still is now. For someone like Paul, who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, the, the expert in the law, to be willing to die for this cause, gives me a lot of hope that the resurrection was a fact. But there you have it. I mean, when it comes down to it, it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of belief. For some you will disagree with what I said this morning, but I do feel it's important for all of us, whether we agree or disagree, to be able to put out in some sort of a way that people can uh, listen to and that you can try and show why you be we believe what we believe. A little bit of a heavier message than we normally give here, but with such an important point, I think it's important for us all to be able to speak about it. And so, if you disagree with me, I'm still here for a few weeks. I'd love to be able to have a chat. <laughs> As I say, my theology has changed dramatically over the years. Um, if I look at one of my sermons from 25 years ago, I am horrified. Um, so we all grow. We all um, grow in our relationships with God. And, and we, uh, that's what's important, is to uh, grow in our relationships together. Let's pray. Gracious God, we do just thank you for this day, and we do thank you for being able to come here together. And we thank you for being able to challenge each other. We thank you for just being able to dig deeper. We uh, know that there can be no way to prove 100% any of the things that we say from here. And so we just pray that in our faith, in our journeys, that you will help us to come to new levels in our relationship with you and to just uh, feel comfortable in our relationship with you, and yet not comfortable enough to not be challenged by others, 
by different writings and to really seek you and to seek you in a close way. And Lord, as we go forward from here today, I just uh, ask that you will help us all to remember to perhaps pick up the phone to our mother or to say a uh, special prayer of thanks for mothers who have gone to be with you already. And we just thank you for the fact that uh, you're a God that loves us. And so just go with us this day. Be with us. Let us share your love and your hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.